Hello everyone, I'm Cameron Carlo. I'm doing my presentation, my brand analysis on Discovery Channel. Uh, I wanted to start with just focusing on Discovery Channel rather than the whole uh, media conglomerate that they have. They have TLC, Animal Planet, Oprah Winfrey Network, uh, Science Channel, a whole bunch of different channels. But each one kind of carries its own brand identity and its own competition and its own way of doing things. Uh, and target demographics in general. So I just really wanted to focus on Discovery Channel, which is in 92 million households. Uh, and in 2011, they did a brand refresh, really focusing on making their their materials more manly or appealing to a male demographic. And that includes all of their like in-house advertising that they'll appear on all their different networks, kind of promoting shows that are on Discovery Channel. And so in 2000 14, they really saw numbers decline, and a lot of that was just some of the programming that they had, which I'll get to in a second. But in 2015, then they really actually improved quite a bit. They saw a rise among 18 to 49 year olds' uh, demographic, 3% rise, and that was huge considering that their biggest competitor, which is History Channel, saw a 26% drop among that same demographic, and that's actually the key advertising demographic, too. But in 2015, for the first time ever, Discovery Channel was the number one non-sports channel among men, which actually really surprised me. But, and you'll kind of see why in a second here with just what they did uh, with their programming. So they had, in 2014, they started doing a lot of these one-time, what they were called stunt uh, shows, like Skywire, where a man walked across Grand Canyon on a tightrope and eaten alive and that was actually the most controversial because it got animal rights groups really riled up when they were going to have a man get consumed by an anaconda well he ended up being half consumed which then made all the people who were viewing it kind of fire back at them on social media saying look you're advertising this eaten alive thing and the guy gets his leg swallowed and you call it good well then they also tried a fake documentary during shark week uh about a serial killer of the sea and that got a lot of criticism as well. So anyways, that president got fired. They brought in a guy named Rich Ross who was at Disney before. And he kind of took a new approach to uh, to their programming, including kind of capitalizing now on the, I guess, real-time crime drama stuff. And that was Killing Fields, which just, I think, started airing this month. And it's about, you know, it, it's... It's a real life story about a guy who comes out of retirement to kind of research a murder he had looked into during his time as a detective. But there's a bunch of that stuff's really popular right now from HBO, Netflix, uh, podcasts even. And so they're also doing some documentaries on uh, environmental acti activism, racing extinction. That was very, very popular. And now uh, Rich Ross is actually pushing a scripted series, and that's a they don't do that at Discovery, so. They're kind of breaking new ground there to try to reach into some di different audiences. So uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but it's pretty daring. And then one other thing that Discovery has is Shark Week, and that is we kind of talked about uh, the dual brand strategies. I know this week in our readings and Discovery Shark Week is a huge thing on social media. It's really popular. I mean, it gets referenced all over the place, even in I think the movie Step Brothers has a big segment on it. So it's just one other thing that they have that's kind of their programming, but they kind of keep it separate. So some of the strengths that that you're going to see with Discovery Channel is the the brand refresh really did grab a hold of the male audience, and they did really grow their audience as well. They also want to expand that now to the whole family, and they're finding ways to be creative with programming. Shark Week's been around forever. Moonshiners has been around, I think, for a few years. That's about you know, families or some people who you know, create their own moonshine and sell it. And then documentaries, uh, they're they're trying all new sorts of things with that, and that's going to be pretty interesting, including, you know, series that are documentaries or just one-time documentaries. Some of their weaknesses is they're starting, like I said, with script series, and they haven't done that before, so that's going to be really interesting to see. They're also biting off the images of that stunt programming that we talked about from 2014 that got the president fired. Some opportunities, like I said, they're capitalizing on the real-life crime dramas. Uh, the online streaming services 
of Shark Week or other specials or something that they could do. I know that some of their shows, once they go off air, they put them on Netflix, and that's a good start. History Channel does that more. And I think that's kind of prompted Discovery to look into it. But I think there is a lot more ways for them to capitalize on that. Some of the threats, as I said, is the online streaming services, and that's the whole cable network in general. The other thing is how much reality TV can you have before things start repeating each other. A lot of their stuff looks a lot like History Channel stuff, and so you're really fighting fire with fire in some cases. But I do want to talk a little bit about <coughs> kind of shifting brand identity, and so that's what I'm focusing questions on this week are uh, as Discovery tries to expand its brand to fit the entire family instead of focusing on men, do you think it would be casting its net too wide? Uh, why or why not? And that's something for me that I, I think is kind of concerning. If they've finally won this male demographic, why try to all right, now let's stretch it to the whole family. And I know the crime drama uh, is is popular among women, according to the New York Times article I was reading, and that's why they want to do that, because they think it's going to hit both demographics. So that's one way that they can do it. The other question is, traditionally, Discovery has been all reality TV with no scripted series. As it now brings in some of those scripted shows, do you think brand loyalists be turned off? Why or why not? And I mean, for me, I just, I really do wonder that. I think if they're really good quality shows, I do hope that Discovery does well. And I don't watch a lot of TV. I actually am one of those people who has switched fully over to the streaming services. So, but because I'm also in the media, I like to keep an eye on what's happening and how people are adapting to some of that. So I think for me, it's going to be <laughs> turning for, for Discovery to, to find that avenue online where people can stream their services whether for a fee or they hook they hook in with Amazon or uh, or Netflix. All right, well, I, that's all the time I have, so uh, I'll put all my sources and stuff in in the post. The some of the New York Times article is very interesting. I'd suggest reading that, and I think the one from there's another source in there too that had some good information. So thanks for watching, and I look forward to seeing you guys this post too. Thanks.